and I'm going to hand over to you. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you, Tom <clears throat> and James, uh, for being here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this session. Um, and, and my colleague, Carolyn, from Soil Association is here as well. I'm from Soil Association. Um, Carolyn and I are both horticultural advisors. Um, I, I'm just going to be here uh, doing a bit of the intro uh, and then we're going to hear from Tom and James, Tom Baxter and James Scribbins. Uh, so a little bit of background to, to, to this, the framing the session. Um, we've established that the UK is, is less than 50% self-sufficient in mushrooms. Um, which is, is somewhat surprising given, given the nature of mushroom growing uh, often indoors in uh, controlled, controlled environments gives the scope to actually break free from that seasonality of that other crops are um, connect, more connected with potentially. Um, so is, is that surprising actually that we are uh, own below 50% um, and does that present an opportunity um, for increasing fairly easily the, the proportion of uh, the, the self-sufficiency um, that that we can uh, acquire in terms of mushrooms grown in the UK. Uh, we're going to hear uh, thoughts and insight on running uh, an, an organic mushroom business, um, kind of the aspirations behind, behind setting things up, uh, and also the kind of the gritty reality of it, I think it's fair to say, um, and pitfalls and challenges um behind uh, behind the scenes uh we're going to touch i think a bit on myco remediation which you may have heard of um which is essentially using mushrooms to to help uh, clean up the environment um to help uh, neutralize certain pollutants um uh, which is quite an exciting prospect uh we'll be looking at the challenges of upscaling mushroom production what it means to, to upscale and, and the, 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 as I say, the challenges uh, in doing so, and whether or not uh, diversifying an, a current enterprise into mushroom production could be a viable solution. Um, so that's, you know, if you've already got a market garden or a, a, some kind of growing enterprise focused on something else, actually adding, adding a mu mushroom production, uh, is, is that, an, is that an, an, a viable option? Uh, and and we'll, we'll have a look at some of that. So how do we support new entrants um, to access growing um, through relatively cheap converted portable spaces, for example, and trial before you buy schemes? Uh, and a brief look at peat. This could really have been a whole session on peat. So this is just a, a, a bit of a brief uh, look at um, building on, if you've heard of the, the project, research project, Organic Plus Research, um, which is looking at phasing out contentious inputs in organic agriculture. And you may well be aware of uh, the kind of ongoing and reigniting uh, uh, interest in peat uh, in general. Uh, the proportion of peat used in the mushroom industry is smaller uh, than, than the, the rest of the kind of horticultural industry, but it's still something that we would like to phase out and have ambitions to do so in the Soil Association regulations by 2025. Uh, and Carolyn is going to cover um, a little bit of insight into to where we're at on that. Um, the, so we've got two founders here today, um, which, is, which is really exciting. Uh, two people with visions to found something. Uh, we're starting with Tom Baxter, founder of the Bristol Fungarium. Uh, if I've said that right, no. uh, in fun <laughs> Fungarium. No. F just. just uh, it's okay. I'll fill you you'll in. Say later. It, you'll say. <laughs> it. I'll try. I'll, not, I'll try not to say it anymore. Uh, the, it was enjoyable uh, this, for all of us. <laughs> okay, yeah. I thought soft G, hard G. It's got to be one of them. <laughs> Uh, in 2019, he downed tools on farm and invested all he had in creating this enterprise, producing the UK's first organic certified medicinal mushrooms. Uh, and today the enterprise crops over a tonne of 18 strains of fungi each month, including maitake, shiitake, king oyster, and seven other strains of oyster mushroom, wine caps, lion's mane, reishi, turkey tail, and cordyceps many of which are now featured in the first UK grown or organic certified range of medicinal mushroom products to hit the market. 
Um, so thanks, Tom, for being here. And we have James Scrivens, uh, who's the head mushroom grower at um, Koyed Talahan, Tal Talalan, sorry, Talalan. <laughs> Absolutely making a hash of these names, Telalan, and the founder of Myco Generation on uh, an online resource to support new mushroom growers and promote mushroom cultivation as a diversification strategy for small to medium scale farming enterprises. And as a site for innovative approaches to mushroom cultivation spanning nearly 20 years, uh, Koya Talalan offers the opportunity to research into applied mycology developing new ideas and techniques to enhance the productivity of integrated agroecosystems, such as using indigenous mycorrhizal inoculants and demonstrating the practice of working with particular species that complement horticulture. Uh, and alongside this, uh, the site has founded a land trust to launch the refungium project that will create a 30 acre fungal nature reserve with a primary objective to increase fungal biodiversity. Uh, and so thank thank you for being here, James, today. We're going to start with Tom. I'm going to hand over uh, who's going to, uh, uh, to kick this off. Thank you. Thanks, all. Uh, I think probably the, uh, the best way of starting is maybe a, a little uh, narrative about um, why I'm here, uh, what we've got up to, and uh, how far in debt I am. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I mean, to cut a long story short, I was... Uh, I've been many things beforehand, um, but I decided to, uh, about oh, what, six years ago now, um, just saw I had a Montessori school and a forest school and um, decided to set up a farm school. And I took over a uh, sort of, probably in total, around about an eight acre organic farm, veg farm, with 10 uh, 90 foot poly tunnels, big glass house few tractors, irrigation systems in place, a few acres outdoors, and um, tried to grow veg on a sort of semi-commercial scale uh, with a couple of uh, workers. That was a lot of work for not a lot of money. And um, needed something that was sort of counter-cyclical, uh, i.e. there's no, apart from root veg, there's not really a lot that grows over the winter periods. And so I decided to um, buy some shipping containers and kit them out with uh, what I thought was necessary in terms of climate control, temperature control, humidity control, never have everything sort of automated. Um, and start growing mushrooms. Originally we were growing uh, mainly oyster mushrooms on straw and I was uh, very keen on uh, not using plastic. And so, I mean, I was actually using plastic but not single use plastic. So I was using, um, sort of 50 litre boxes and uh, sort of cold fermenting, um, large bales of straw and fighting the good fight and trying to do it that way. It really wasn't scalable. Um, I mean, we were, it's a huge amount of work. Working with straw is uh, a nightmare. Um, it was very low tech. Uh, and it, it worked some of the time. Um, and and then I started buying, there's a company called Forest Fungi down in Devon, who was who are actually supplying Riverford uh, with a lot of their shiitake and um, some of their king oysters. And they are they were buying everything in from Holland at the time. And so I started buying in blocks pre-inoculated from Holland, uh, which I still do for some of the stuff we grow shiitake, king oysters, actually some of the grey oysters we've got at the moment as well. Um, and just scaled up from there and uh, yeah. And so I then started supplying farm, well, I was already supplying farm drop, started supplying farm drop and the demand for mushrooms was such that I, you know, stopped really growing veg um, and put everything into the mushrooms. And so uh, then one day, actually ironically enough, how we got to where we are now is that I was foraging, I've always foraged for mushrooms for quite a few years, I don't know, 20, years or something and um yeah we found quite a rare lion's mane a uh, rare mushroom called a lion's mane in the southwest and they cut the um the tree down that it was growing on so i got in contact well, i managed to find out who the landowner was to have a have a go at him um and then asked him if he had any land for sale he, he was like why do you want land you can't make any money out of land um and i said well, i want to build a barn and he said well i've got millions of barns 
Um, and so he then showed me around various farms of his. And uh, so we took over this barn and he built it for us. Um, and then he asked us if we wanted the farmhouse next door that had been empty for a year. Uh, and so we moved into the farmhouse next door as well. So we've had this sort of quite large um, four and a half thousand square foot insulated barn built for us. And we now live next door, which is great, but it's cost quite a lot to um, scale up. At the moment, we're, we're cropping quite a lot more than a ton a month, actually, probably. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how much, like 1.6 to two tons a month, probably at the moment. Um, we're selling into London and Bristol. Uh, we supply quite a few of the, the restaurants. Um, we sort of capped the amount we actually sell in terms of fresh edibles now at sort of three, three and a half thousand a week pounds. Um, it's a pretty difficult model to make work when you're just selling wholesale, uh, which I think is going to be an issue for anyone that's trying to get into this space um, on a small scale, because whilst you can make a, you know, a, a sort of passable income uh, going to market um, to get it any bigger you've got to sell wholesale um, and then you're coming up against the Dutch the Japanese Korean the Chinese imports at the wholesale market and you just can't compete on price um, you can compete on quality and certainly being organic certified helps to a degree not so much for the restaurants but with some of the wholesalers like you know some of the organic um, uh, yeah, some of the organic whole food shops that certainly helps. Um, but yeah, in terms of scalability on the edible business, I mean, I know quite a few people that are growing similar sort of amounts to me. I know a couple that are growing a bit more. And even the guys that have got the contracts with uh, Riverford and Abel and Cole, they all find it really hard at the moment. And I think, um, you know, in terms of what he was saying previously in regards to the fact that we're only 50%. Um, I'd be surprised if we're even 50%, to be honest, but 50% uh, self-sufficient in mushrooms. I mean, the vast majority of the mushroom market is the um, butter mushroom or uh, Garicus bosphorus market. And we just can't compete with, with Poland mainly. Um, you know, the big, the big players in the market from a commercial perspective are like the Livesey Brothers, uh, Smithies, and... Um, Monahans over in Ireland who've got some pretty big sites over in Poland um, and I don't see there being any real change I know quite a few um, butter mushroom farmers that have gone out of business in the last three years um, unfortunately we just can't compete on price the cost of labor is too high over here uh, well it's not too high but it's too high to be able to compete with um, European suppliers um, and yeah the idea that we can grow uh large amounts of exotic mushrooms on a small scale and employ a lot of people is pretty delusional um if you look at what's happened with uh the mushroom market on a sort of bigger scale with uh, smithies have recently sold a chunk of equities to some chinese try a big chinese company and hyundai have just bought a massive chunk of the livesey brothers and they've got big uh, planning applications in up north for huge barns. So they're going to be pumping out a lot of these exotic mushrooms that I grow and that a lot of the smaller growers grow. And so they're going to be hitting the, um, the UK supermarkets probably in 12 to 18 months. And the, the price is going to, you know, plummet. Um, what they'll be doing is bringing in large amounts of um, substrate from China uh, that Substrate, I know because I spoke to one of the guys at Smithies, about half of it is going to be organic certified before it arrives. Um, so they are also going to be bringing in organic certified uh, substrate, um, which is going to be put in refrigerated shipping containers, shipped over here. It'll take about eight weeks to get over here, and then they'll fruit it over here. So the whole sort of supply chain is not really going to be English. It's not really, and to be honest, it's not really going to be organic, even though it is going to be certified. Um, and so I don't really, I don't really see there being a lot of space in this market for um, people to start up. I mean, I know a lot of people that are starting up at the moment. I know three people that have decided to call it a day in the last two months. Um, it's a pretty, I think, apart from strawberry picking, it's probably the most labour-intensive 
of you know any form of agriculture um and with the price of labor over here it's very 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 difficult to make to make the numbers add up um so unless there's some sort of i don't know some sort of government scheme where they um subsidize the wages i just can't see how you can justify the capital investment needed to um be able to certainly grow butter mushrooms and that is a big one and now that the, the big guys are moving into the exotic market I, there's not going to be a lot of space in 18 months time for for people to be able to make a living out of it i don't i don't think i mean i might be wrong but it's certainly a lot tighter um in terms of what we're doing here slightly differently is we're going out uh well i'm going out foraging um wild mushrooms and then we bring them back into our setup here and cloning them in the lab and then um growing them onto you know to grain spawn and then growing them on in the fruiting chamber and around about probably around about 20 percent of the time does the wild uh the wild mushrooms that we find create a viable commercially viable um mushroom uh you can play around with the genetics in terms of you know collecting spores off those and you might get lucky but it, it's quite a long process it's sort of five to six months depending on the mushroom uh before you ascertain whether or not you've really got a commercially viable strain to work with and that takes you know when only 20 percent of it's not even that it's probably 15 percent of the time does one of those strains work the lead time is quite long before you know if you've got a viable one um so at the moment we're growing uh, UK native strains of lion's vein, um, turkey tail, oyster, um, uh, anoki or uh, velvet shanks. Um, what other ones? Oh, maitake. Um, oh, and recently this year we've just got a reishi working that was found in Wales. Um, so. The majority of our medicinal uh, mushrooms are actually UK strains, but it's taken, you know, nearly two years now to get to the point and a huge number of different strains uh, to actually get to the point where we think, you know, where pretty much every every particular mushroom we're growing for the um, medicinal side is UK strain. And the reason we're doing this twofold, um, firstly, from a sort of protecting the biodiversity of our, our location we're releasing billions of spores into the atmosphere pretty much every day and if we can release uk native strains and also they're all well not all of them but they're all from somerset um and at least yes yeah, six of them are from within like two miles of the farm and so we're trying to do our you know our little bit to um just release natural you know local strains into the environment here um, also, the, the project that we're working on at the moment, which is to use our spent substrate um, in terms of basically to clean waterways. Um, we've got a very, very sort of Huckleberry Finn type uh, experiment going on at the moment where we're um, growing using our spent substrate in three different tanks where we're putting in um, a known amount of phosphates and nitrates and growing them in you know, a known amount of water for a five week period and then test and see how much of those phosphates and nitrates have been taken out of that uh, that water uh, before we then take it down to the local river, which is at the bottom of this state that we've got uh, permission to basically cut some cut some channels in and uh, do some sort of field scale projects in early in the new year. Um, but until we've actually got some data, we just don't know whether or not it's going to be even worthwhile doing um but obviously we need local strains in order to be able to put them out into the um out into the you know the local countryside um and so uh, yeah and so that's that's the situation from our perspective um it's taken us you know from a cost perspective it's probably cost about 150,000 to get to this stage uh we're still not a break even um, we're selling around about £25,000 a month um, across both the medicinal and edible side. Um, and we're not a break even. Break even for us is probably 27000 at the moment. Um, I think like there's a sort of false, uh, um, there's a false perception that mushrooms offer a relatively low 
uh, low. I mean, there are, you can grow mushrooms in a pretty cheap way, but as soon as you want to have continuity of supplies so that you can supply the same product at the same quality at the same time every week at any scale, you need to have infrastructure in place. Uh, you need to be able to control the environment irrespective of what's going on outside. Um, it's very easy to grow mushrooms about four months of the year when the outdoor climatic conditions are basically ideal. So you can just, you know, pipe in the air from outside. But in the summer months, it becomes prodigiously difficult to keep the temperatures down to 14 degrees um, all the time. You spend a huge amount on electricity. Um, in the winter, it's much, much cheaper to heat. Um, so that does work. Um, but also with electricity prices going up, uh, it's, you know, it's going to be tight again on that side. Um, and the other sort of dirty secret of mushroom growing is just the amount of plastic you use. Um, I mean, like I say, when we originally started doing it, we were trying to use no single use plastic. Um, and we are inoculating quite a lot of um, our medicinal ones onto um, logs as well, so that... Um, so that, um, you know, so that basically we'll have some level of supply from a slightly more natural um, source. And we've also found, to be honest, that growing mushrooms off substrate, which isn't sawdust, but which is off logs, actually yields a better quality mushroom. But the other issue you've got then is what level of control do you have when they fruit? And that's difficult. I know that you can, you know, you can buy cattle prods and electric shock them and everything else. You can cold shock them. But, you know, at the moment, we're finding it quite difficult to get any level of control over log growing mushrooms. Um, and so, you know, the practicalities of doing it are, it's more complicated than I ever thought it would be, put it that way. Um, but where we're at now is that it looks like we've got a business that, you know, is going to be financially viable. Uh, we employ about one, two, three, four, five, sort of six people now. Um, and we've got a few people on the government Kickstarter scheme, which has really helped uh, from a cost perspective. Um, and we've been exceptionally fortunate in terms of the people that have been applying. And we've been pretty amazed actually by some of the people that have been applying for jobs. Actually, the, the phone call I just missed was. Anya, who's just left Oxford with a first class in human sciences, who's joining us next week. Uh, we've had yeah three of the people who've joined us uh, all have first class degrees from proper universities, mainly in biology or microbiology, and so we're getting exceptionally exceptionally motivated, competent, mainly young women, to be honest, um, who are coming on board and really helping us, you know, do a lot of the science that we wouldn't necessarily have been able to do with just me and Henry, who are very uneducated in comparison with our employees now, <laughs> so uh, which is great. I mean, um, the, on the positive, the one thing I will say about my is that they're more there's there is a science to growing them, there is a slight amount of art form to it as well. Um, and so you can, in some, some sort of esoteric way have a slightly greater relationship with the mushrooms than you can with the vegetables um so you know having spent yeah three years growing a huge amount of veg uh, both in the polytunnels but also at field scale um it is nice having a higher level of control um you, i naively thought that i was actually going to have you know complete control <laughs> but that's that's never the case um and so yeah i think in terms of if people are thinking about bolting this onto some sort of existing growing operation, it's really difficult to bolt on um, if you're going to do any of the, except unless you're just buying in bags and freezing them, then yeah, you can possibly bolt it on and it will add an extra revenue stream uh, because mushrooms have a huge amount of potential in terms of what they can grow off. They can grow off a huge amount of agricultural waste. Um, you can pretty much grow a lot of the mushrooms we grow off 
straw, off, um, you know, maize husks, off all sorts of things, pretty much anything. You can grow them off, as long as, you know, they've got lignin and they, can, and they can break them down. But the problem is, is actually doing that at scale, at any meaningful scale, because you need a uniformity of substrate in order to be able to do it at any scale. And as soon as you start, you know, we used to take a lot of waste off one of the sawmills here, and um, we would take not a huge amount, but maybe a ton a week, maybe, maybe a bit less, but around a ton a week. But because of the, because they're always playing with different types of wood, it made it quite difficult to have uh, a uniformity of um, substrate to grow from. And so in the end, we had to stop using them, even though, you know, it's a great thing to do in terms of circular uh, usage of, um, of just stuff that's local. And there are big opportunities, I think, potentially, you know, with ash dieback for using ash um, to grow uh, a lot of the mushrooms off. Um, but yeah, it's, it's possible, but people really need finance. That is the one thing they need. They need, you need finance. You need some level of finance and some level of, um, yeah, someone that you can go to and someone who um, can help you get into one or two, you know, larger companies because trying to just supply restaurants is remarkably hard work. I mean, we supply, we probably sell about one and a half thousand pounds a week into re restaurants, but the distribution takes a huge amount of time and it, there's a lot of parts of this business that you don't really appreciate until you've actually tried to do it. And distribution is a very big part of um, our cost base and our time base. And so, uh, yeah, theoretically, there's a lot you can do with mushrooms. But I think as soon as you try and scale it, the realities of uh, economics start to, you know, really hit hit you in terms of what you can actually manage in a practical level. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can show you, I can just quickly show you around the process if you'd like in the barn. I mean, I've got a few few of the mushrooms just here to show you. So this is uh, this is a little lion's mane. So we grow around about um, 30 to 40 kilos of lion's mane a week. Um, and all of that now goes into our tinctures. Um, we grow quite a lot of these, which are king oysters or an edgy. This is a non-native strain, um, but this is just for the edible market. Um, and then we've got some uh, Ganoderma lucidum or reishi. Um, this is actually not the Somerset strain. This is a commercial strain, but we will have the Somerset strain in a couple of weeks, hopefully fruiting. Um, and then, and this is the classic oyster mushroom, which I naively thought you could base a business around. Uh, you can't. Um, they are, they are, however, very easy to grow, um, and they will grow off anything. And the mycelium is very aggressive and um, runs very quickly. And that 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 is actually one. That's actually a clone of one that we found over in um, Abbot's Pond, uh, which is near Bristol. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, maybe I should uh, give you a quick quick run round of the uh, the joys that is the uh, the Bristol fungarium. So just bear with me. So it's, we're mid build, so, you know, be gentle with me. So uh, this is our temporary kitchen area. We've actually got in the tea urns at the moment, some, um, some uh, tincture just boiling down. It takes, it takes us about 58 hours to boil the tincture down to the consistency. We're boiling it at 62 degrees. So it takes a very long time. You can't, if you raise it above 65 degrees, the protein starts homogenizing. And, you know, you can't do that. What we, oh, this here has been a wonderful bit of kit. This is actually what winemakers use for uh, filtering wine. And you can put one micron uh, thick filters in it, which takes out everything, including bacteria. And that, you know, means that you've got absolutely nothing in there apart from the tincture, um, which is great. This here is a very large, uh, you can't really see it, but it's a very large ribbon mixer. So that's for mixing up the substrate. We can mix like 800 kilos of substrate in there at a time. These are uh, barrel sterilizers that we've built, which I don't know if you can see in there. They're like giant kettles, really. Um, and those run on 24 hour cycles. This ribbon here 
is the room where we, uh, once we've cooked up the stuff, that's a laminar flow hood there, where we mix up the bags in front of it. Um, and then we store them in here to incubate. So in here at the moment, it's called chip. That's chippy. It was my friend who found the reishi in Wells. So that's Somerset reishi. And there's various other bags in there incubating. Try and keep this room at 22 degrees. And the bags can stay in there from anywhere from two weeks to two months. Um, this big bit of kit here is a... Well, it's, a, it's basically a boiling pan. It's a bit more complicated than that, but um, but that's for doing sort of 300 litres of extract at a time. And um, in here is going to be our extract room once I've built it. Um, and then up here, this is actually a, um, we're building a fruiting chamber to go in a, a restaurant called the Ledbury in London, which is a two Michelin star restaurant. Um, they want to grow mushrooms in the restaurant. So this is us mocking up a design, just checking it was all working. Um, this, is a 20, this is a very large bit of kit. It's a 25 litre Sotslet, basically, um, which we can make extra. We can do alcohol extraction, so it, but it's pretty dangerous, to be honest. Um, so we're a bit worried about running it. And then in here, we have our lab room where uh, we make up. Yeah, where we do all our sort of like, like um, sterile work and get the little. So that is. Oh, that's turkey tail. So, yeah, so this is where we clone them up, and here are some of the um, cordyceps we're growing. And so, yeah, and as you can see, there's a huge number of things. <laughs> so, yeah, and so once we've done all of that, we then um, take it down to the fruiting chamber, which is where all the mushrooms are, which I'll show you now. Ooh. Put my shoes back on. And uh, this is amazing because these are the tinctures that we make now. Uh, oh, and that's like the final product. Beautiful little maitake tinctures. Um, so yeah, that's that. Let me show you the slightly more exciting mushrooms. So, uh, let's give you a quick look in here. And then this is where the mushrooms are. So these ones here are all maitake. Or Hand of the Woods. Uh, we've got some of our lion's mane there. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some kings in there. I think we've probably got around about, um, I don't know, 4,000 bags in here, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, it's got a little lines right there. A lot of oysters down here. More yellow oysters there. And then lots of uh, shiitake here. I don't know if you can see those. So, so yeah, that's uh, the other thing no one tells you when you start a mushroom farm is just how much money you're going to have to spend on shelving that's uh, a big um, a big yeah i mean huge amounts i think we've probably spent yeah nearly probably eighteen thousand pounds on shelving now um so there's just yeah there's lots there's lots of it it's good fun uh, but it will it will terrify you from a bank account perspective um so so yeah and that's that is really i guess that's really where we're at now um got a barn Growing mushrooms, not enough. Um, tried to make money off the land and, um, you know, largely failed so far. So um, hopefully we will soon, though. And I think that's, yeah, that's about all I've got to say on the matter. All right. Thank you so much, Tom, uh, for your insight and experience and all the challenges you're facing. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear your 
perspective and have that virtual tour. So yeah, well. Anna, interestingly, I would oh. say that, you know, it can be viable as a sole business. You need to have some money um, and you need to have free labor. Um, so in terms of a CSA, it, it can work. Um, it can work. If you're just at, like, I've, I've talked with some, some of the people in Bristol about putting some of our ship because we've got quite a few shipping containers that we're not using that we've tacked up uh, um, about putting them onto, you know, a site like uh, grow, like um, Feed Bristol site, for example. But the reality is, you, you know, someone needs to spend 25, 30 hours a week, you know, with those mushrooms. And, um, you know, unless it's free labor, then, you know, the, the, you're not going to be able to make enough money. I mean, I, I supply, I give, I give, I supply certain um, box schemes as well with mushrooms. And I think, it, you know, there are times a year where you could, like, for example, we used to grow a lot of King's Trafoy or wine cap. And we had like two, like, um, actually, we had three 40 foot beds. Um, and they're great. I mean, they're, they're really, really good at breaking down you know, fresh shit, basically. You can put a huge amount of like fresh manure down, cover it in wood chip, and within three months, you have the most amazing hummus. Um, so, so in terms of like integrating mushrooms into systems on a farm, I think they've got a part to play and you will at, at various points have some revenue stream off them. But in terms of trying to make it an integral part of a offering, Unless you've got sort of a dedicated uh, person doing it, which is going to involve a salary, then you're going to you're going to need to be selling you know whatever twenty grand a year in mushrooms just to cover that salary, um, and that's a lot of mushrooms. And so, um, yeah, I think you could incorporate it. You know, you could incorporate. You could buy in the um, you could buy in the the blocks and fruit them. And if you were getting full retail. And this is the problem with a lot of CSA schemes. They're like, they don't tend to be selling it for retail price. And in order to make it viable, you really do need to get full retail price. Um, and so, so, yeah, I think it's it's possible. But I think the issue is in 18 months time, you're gonna be able to buy these mushrooms grown in England at the wholesale market for about six or seven or eight pounds a kilo. Um, and therefore, what's going to be the just justification for a CSA scheme growing their own mushrooms when they can't, you know, they can't really do it at that price anyway. They might as well just buy them in, you know, from Smithies or from Livesy Brothers or from Monahans who, who will have put all this money into the massive, um, massive setups they're going to have very shortly. Um, and they're just going to be fruiting this Chinese uh, substrate that's going to be brought in. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's a good. It's a definitely a good thing to do, but whether or not it's a economically viable thing to do when you can just buy it, when you're going to be able to just buy them in um, at a pretty cheap price. Yeah. I don't know. I think um, you know. I wish that wasn't the case, but I think that is going to be the case, unfortunately. Tom, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, push on to let James um, present his his ideas now. Thank you so much for 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 your insights um so james if you if you want to take over and um set up with your screen share okay <clears throat> that'd be great all right is that working great yeah okay yeah thanks tom um so i'm going to try and argue that uh you can uh it can work at a medium scale um, but uh, it's good to put that in 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 the context that I'm I'm working in here, and um, <clears throat> I'm out in in Wales. Uh, we have a uh, seventy acre woodland, and uh, we have planning permission to build a house through the One Planet Development <clears throat> uh, scheme that they have here, um, which allows people to build south build in the open countryside, providing they can. Um, meet a certain level of their subsistence needs um, and make uh, uh, enough income from a land-based livelihood to cover their minimum needs. So I'm not looking to make lots of money. Um, I, I'm not interested in, in a large-scale mushroom cultivation setup. Um, uh, our minimum needs target, and that's between me and my partner, Sarah, 
is actually ten thousand pounds a year. Um, obviously, this is a you know a, quite a privileged position, but the, you know that's where we're coming from. So, um, the types of mushroom growing scheme that I've got here um, are small to medium scale, and I think they'd work quite well alongside a CSA or a market garden. Um, and they could be ad adapted to people that already have access to a to a you know a, a local market. So we're talking sort of more sort of regional scale uh, marketing here. Um, anyway, yeah. So um, we uh, we have this woodland. We set up a land trust um, uh, because it's you know we don't need seventy acres. So there's a question of what to do with um, uh, the land, how we can share that uh, access to that land. Um, so uh, with half of the Woodland here, we um, uh, are putting together this uh, fungal restoration project, a, a fungal nature reserve um, that will prioritize uh, fungal biodiversity and try and monitor how that would have hopefully a knock on positive effects and other aspects of biodiversity. Um, uh, and as for the enterprise here, yeah, we, uh, I'm growing mushrooms. I'm mostly going shiitake, torquetail, oysters. Um, but because I run courses, uh, so we welcome people here. We have this off-grid lab set up and people can come and stay in the woods. It's quite appealing place to come and learn for a weekend how to grow mushrooms. I can, I, I, I have the um, opportunity to play, still play around with growing mushrooms. So I, I can grow uh, uh, you know, uh, a wider variety on, on a much smaller scale. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, subsidize that with the income from the courses. Um, Okay, so that's not very good, is it? Um, yeah, so, oh God, how do I do back? Um, all right, so can you see the whole screen there? That seems to have, can you see everything on the screen? I think we're just missing a letter. I think it's okay. Okay, all right. So um, uh, as for mushroom cultivation, um, uh, what we're looking at here is um, uh, quite easy to grow mushrooms. Um, that uh, would complement uh, existing horticultural setups. Um, so um, we're just focusing at the moment on, on promoting uh, shiitake, turkey tail, oyster, king shifera, wood bluet, and almond portobello. Um, uh, the, uh, and we're trying to look at ways of minimizing plastic, um, use equipment that uh, would already be on site. It's easy, easy easy to access and adapt and uh, to focus on low energy processing. Um, along so, uh, alongside this, we've got this project of converting truck boxes, refrigerated truck boxes rather than shipping containers. Um, and then trying to uh, solve this problem about spawn supply. Um, so uh, there are a few good spawn supplies in the UK, but uh, especially in the last year, there was a huge demand. It was quite difficult to get hold of um, spawn from the usual suppliers because, uh, so for instance, Woodland Gourmet Mushrooms up in up in Leeds, um, he had a huge backlog. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, the question is, if we're going to have a number of these uh, CSAs or market guys adopting growing schemes, where are they going to get the spawn from? Um, uh, and then we're also looking at mycorrhizal fungi um, and uh, how to incorporate that into um, our horticultural um, uh, schemes here. Um, OK, so um, firstly, shiitake um, outdoors. Um, so I'm growing them outdoors. At the moment, I've just been doing this on a small scale. So I've been inoculating um, uh, 50 logs a year. Uh, so this is hardly anything really, um, but now we scaled that up um, uh, to 220 logs a year. Um, uh, so uh, outdoors, um, uh, you have, um, uh, so what's the yeah, pros and cons of shiitake cultivation? So you have uh, slightly more control over fruiting than other outdoor cultures with shiitake uh, on logs, you can shock them into into fruiting. Um, once you've got this log inoculated, it lasts as a substrate for a relatively long amount of time. You've got four years, four to five years, depending on the type of wood, um, and they're quite easy to sell. Most people have heard of shiitakes; it's a familiar mushroom. Um, I don't have any problems selling them. Uh, I dry them and sell them as well. Um, 
the difficulties are uh, the amount of labor involved um, with the usual process of shocking them, uh, initiating them. Um, and of course, you've got issues with pests, um, slugs in particular. Um, okay, so this is an example of what could be a medium grow, medium scale growing scheme for shiitakes. So um, uh, aiming at 200 logs a year, uh, that means that year five, you would have um, 800 logs to play with. Uh, uh, you can shock them, but you have to rest them after they're, they're shocked. Uh, you have to recuperate. So um, I work on an eight week rotation. So throughout the growing season for this um, warmer fruiting strain, it's just strain, which is from April through this, uh, September, I can shock a log three times on this eight week rotation. Um, so that means I've got 100 logs uh, a week that uh, I can fruit. Um, uh, now you can, uh, it's, it's, yeah, uh, you've got to be able to predict roughly how much, you know, you can get from one of these logs. You see the picture there, each of those logs, it's more than a hundred grams, uh, uh, from one of those logs. Um, but if you're going to, some of the logs might not work, you know, you're getting very, uh, variations in the, in the yield. So, you know, uh, you can, you can, you'd be unlucky not to get, you know, on average, 100 grams a from a log. So you could plan to have 10 kilos fresh. Any excess, you can dry. So I dry mine. Um, I expose them to sunlight. So, um, you can see I've got these um, perforated stainless steel um, trays. So I dry them um, to begin with. It's gill side up in the sun. This increases the vitamin D content, um, which is another marketing um, uh, uh, aspect okay why isn't the okay there we go um yeah so um i'm not going to go through all of this um and this will be on our website with um uh, all the all the figures and everything um but uh yeah you can see that's basically what i was saying the the the, the inputs are relatively small so to inoculate 220 logs you need about 15 kilos of sawdust spawn um you need two kilos of wax uh, with two people, you can get it done uh, in 10 to, 10 to 14 hours, is my estimate. Um, it, it's, it, we, we were lucky here because, again, we, we've got kind of a bit of a following. So people come out and help us inoculate the logs. Um, with a group of you, you can get it done quite quickly. And it's you know, quite a, um, a social thing to do. If it's just you uh, drilling away on these logs, it can be quite demoralizing. But um, yeah, luckily we get some help. Um, and then you've got to, um, then there's a the laying of the logs. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so they have to be moved and, and incubated for a, a year. It takes uh, uh, 12 to 18 months until they're ready to fruit. Um, and then uh, the process of shocking them, the traditional way is to soak them in, in cold water and then strike them with uh, a mallet or um, strike them against the ground. So this is where, one of the aspects where the, the amount of labor, um, once you start to scale up, becomes uh, slightly unreasonable. Um, but uh, yeah, there has been, um, and Tom mentioned it, um, uh, a lot of research into high voltage shock, shock, high voltage pulse shocks of substrates to initiate fruiting. And there's a grower outside Kamadan that uses a cattle prod to shock his logs into fruiting. Um, so this is what we're going to experiment with, whether we can uh, keep the logs in situ without having to move them um, and, uh, and shock them with, uh, with a cattle prod. Um, so uh, if we can keep the labor down to that amount, this is the, the, the scheme. So at the moment I'm growing them um, uh, uh, by uh, cross stacking them on, on raised bars. Um, uh, I first started doing this by uh, raising them with sand underneath. Um, this is to hopefully, keep, it keeps off the slugs. Uh, they still find a way, but you know, it does keep the slugs down. Um, so um, yeah, I'm using these raised bars and uh, I have a sprinkler system. Um, so I, yeah, well, I'm at the moment, I'm still, cause I'm, I, I'm not uh, shocking this amount. I'm still using uh, the stream to shock them, but this is why I'm suggesting that the sprinklers are then left on for 12 hours um, uh, and then um, shocked after that soak. Um, but 
and I am because you're raising them off the ground like this, uh, you have all this growing space underneath. So um, I'm using a trench culture with reishi to grow reishis underneath the shiitakes. So um, at the moment, I'm just doing. I've got two of these um, uh, these bars set up with uh, with the reishis growing underneath. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, obviously this would have to be scaled up to having um, eight of these uh, these uh, ten meter rows. Um, so that's the space you're talking about. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's shiitake. Um, uh, I grow turkey tail, and this is this is by far the easiest mushroom to grow uh, on locks. Um, you're almost guaranteed 100% you know, success rate inoculating uh, a log with turkey tail. Um, so uh, I'm um, I'm inoculating 200 logs a year, and this is going to go up to 400 logs. I'm using smaller size. Um, uh, branches, any size basically from uh, from birch mostly that I'm thinning out in the woodlands. Um, uh, they don't last as long as, as a substrate as the uh, shiitake logs. They only, yeah, I'm, I'm only getting a decent flush out of them for, for two years. Um, and again, 100 grams, yeah, you're almost guaranteed to get 100 grams from even the smaller branches. Um, so, uh, so far I've, I've harvested this year um, uh, about 10 kilos of, uh, of turkey tail. Um, I've got a wholesale price at 140 pounds a kilo and uh, I'm retailing them on the website uh, for 18 pounds a kilo, so 100 gram uh, bags and sell them uh, whole or shredded. So I have a, a industrial grain mill I can shred. Um, and I'm having no problem selling this. I've, I, you know, I pre-sold a lot of the, 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 the turkey tail. There's a, a lot of interest in this mushroom now. Um, uh, so this is a, another sort of low hanging fruit for you know, anyone that has access to uh, logs, um, uh, woodland or you know, um, uh, can access logs through uh, some other means, um, you know, tree surgeon or landscape gardeners or, or what have you. Um, uh yeah um very easy to do um so uh uh yeah let's move on to um some other examples here so um king Shafaria, very simple uh technique of growing mushrooms on wood chip um uh, i grow this as a as a mulch around fruit trees and fruit bushes um but this year i made a so experimenting with um, how much you could get per square meter um, from uh, a more focused attempt at, at growing it. So, you know, uh, using a more substrate, basically, a kind of a mound culture um, going up to a depth of about 10 inches. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not... The problem with King's with King Street, it's also called wine cap, which sounds a bit more marketable. Now, Tom, you did tell me a couple of years ago, you were getting people asking you um, about uh, wine cap, um, uh, King Street areas. So uh, it is getting more well known, um, but uh, it's not something you know you, you, you see um, very regularly, not around here anyway. Um, but um, yeah, uh, very easy to grow. Um, uh, I heard a few months ago somebody made a, a 60 square meter bed and um, harvested uh, over 200 kilos from 60 square meters. So you can grow quite a lot of mushroom using this technique. Um, and yeah, if you've got access to wood chip, you know, it's, it's very, very simple. Um, uh, I grow wood bluets here. So I have my own strain of wood bluet. Um, this is a commonly known uh, forage mushroom. Um, has a very strong flavor. It's uh, it's great dried um, and used as as uh, you know, it, to to flavor uh, food. Um, but this again is quite easy to grow, and it's very and both of these mushrooms here, the the king Shafir and Wibble, are very easy to culture yourself. So um, if you do get set up growing it, you could um, you wouldn't have necessarily have to rely on buying any more spawn on it. Would you could sell you could propagate it yourself quite easily using these very simple methods um uh of, of using cardboard um yeah. anyway yeah so the um uh the wood bluets um we grow on a mix of of manure and wood chip and sawdust um 
and I'm inoculating the compost piles. So my hope is that using, so we're trying to use a, a no dig method. So we're making a lot of compost using a lot of mulch, but I'm inoculating that compost with, with wood bloat in the hope that um, the, uh, the beds will fruit wood bloats in the winter. It's a winter fruit and mushroom. So when nothing out much else is going on, we get wood bloats. Um, again, if you're more focused to make uh, long rows of, um, of these beds, um, you're going to get much higher yields. But this is something that can work alongside other growing schemes. Um, uh, Almond Portobello, this um, Agaricus subfrunescent, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting medicinal mushroom. It's like a, it's like a cousin of the, uh, the Agaricus bisporus, the, you know, the white and brown mushrooms you find in the supermarkets. Um, uh, and uh, I've grown this on leach cow manure. So there's a, there's a, a farm down the road that has a, a manure leacher. So it squeezes out all of the liquid and you're left with this roughage. Um, it's a very easy substrate to, to work with. Um, and so I grew this in, in uh, large uh, tubs um, uh, using that leach manure with uh, spawning it straight into these tubs. And um, I got two flushes from it from the from the tubs and I chucked the uh, spent substrate into the polytunnel. I'm still getting um, these uh, mushrooms coming up in the polytunnel now. So this might again work well as a as a sort of a mulch um, in a polytunnel. Um, uh, so we're going to test that out next year. Um, uh, and then finally the um, oh man, what was it? Uh, the alm oyster. Um, this uh, I don't think this is really scalable. Yeah, uh, so this is using sawdust and straw, um, and I'm using this as a mulch under brassicas. Um, it uh, it increases the yield of brassicas. Whether it's the you know, it's actually the alm moist that does this, or it's just the fact that you're making this nice mulch uh, underneath the brassicas, um, it does it does increase the yield of brassicas. Uh, um, I, uh, I I repeated the experiment that was made uh, by Paul Stamets growing alm moisture under Brussels sprouts. And, and sure enough, the, the Brussels sprouts that had this alm moisture mulch were, uh, were much bigger. Uh, they, they were much more uh, higher yielding. Um, it's a really nice mushroom. It's a very nice kind of chestnut-y flavor. Um, uh, so yeah, this is, you know, if you've got access to the sawdust, then um, this is a, another one that you can grow in the garden. Um, uh, we're also making our own uh, indigenous mycorrhizal inoculums, inoculants. Um, uh, uh, I won't go into this now. So this is a quite, you know it's a whole other subject, but it is quite simple. It's basically growing grass in bags. Um, uh, but yeah, this is something that uh, a technique that was developed by the Rodale Institute in the states, um, uh, well, nearly a decade ago now, and it was designed to uh, encourage. Uh, horticultural practices to make their own uh, mycorrhizal inoculants. Um, okay, so uh, that's the mushrooms in the garden. So the, the whole question of oyster mushrooms, it is the easiest mushroom to grow. Um, you can grow it on lots of different substrates and the most uh, uh, common substrate that you see it growing on is straw. Um, so there's uh, a couple of options here. Um, there's one option, yeah, there's the, the, the fermenting option, which I, I haven't left, I've left out here, but, uh, but yeah, we, this is with trop straw. You've got either heat pasteurization, submersion in water, 74 degrees for one to two hours. Um, obviously that's gonna use a, quite a lot of energy. Um, uh, what I'm doing now is using calcium hydroxide or, or this lime pasteurization uh, technique. Um, that's uh, again submerging, submerging, submerging in water. It's a pH above twelve um, for four to twelve hours. Um, and of course, you have to neutralize that water with an acid. I'm using citric acid to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, this is what I've. Uh, this is what I'm using. So uh, taking the IBC, I've cut the top third off, um, and. Uh, here, you can see here, this is a kind of mesh screen. It's raised off of the bottom with bricks. The straw goes in there. I can easily get 20 kilos of straw into this container. So this is a way of processing uh, at most 20 kilos of straw. Um, <clears throat> I can then, I've got this submergible pump and it's, it's uh, 
cycling the water through this PVC, uh, 32 mil PVC pipe setup. Um, don't really have to do that, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, I'm hoping that makes it more efficient. I'm getting a, a good even distribution of that, um, that, that uh, alkaline solution throughout the substrate. Um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, uh, what have we got here? Yeah, so the cost there, you can see it's quite, oh, God. Um, it's quite low. Um, uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, incredibly cheap um, amount of, uh, of calcium hydroxide that's used there. If you're buying in straw, I'm buying it in, in, in a, a small bale, so it's like 15 kilos. Um, it costs about three pounds. Um, actually doing that, chopping up the straw, sticking it in there, uh, uh, adding the water, doesn't take that long. Um, obviously, you know, that work comes out, it goes into the top half of the IBC, uh, the spawn gets mixed in there and it goes into buckets. So I'm trying to use buckets rather than um, plastic tubing. Um, I do have a load of plastic tubing as, a, as an example, but this is one of the problems with, as Tom says, you know, the uh, amount of single use plastic that she, um, uh, that's involved in in this, this uh, way of making these artificial straw logs, you know. Um, plastic buckets, they work just fine. It means you just have to wash a lot of buckets. Um, uh, but yeah, I, you know, with a 25 litre bucket, you can fit uh, the equivalent of what would be two kilo of dry weight straw into one of those 25 litre buckets. So we're talking about using 10 buckets, 10 buckets a week with this process. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Well, we can come back to that. So yeah, but um, you you need to you need to grow this in a in a in a more controlled environment. You can stick them in polytunnels, but it's not ideal. You're going to get lots of pests. Uh, it's much harder to control the temperature. Um, they will fruit, but it's not going to. You're not going to get the best amount of yield. So the question is like how to come up with a with a grow room um, that's relatively cheap. So uh, this was the project turning these insulated truck boxes into grow rooms rather than shipping containers. Smaller shipping containers cost a lot of money now. Um, they're more hard to come by. Um, but these uh, truck boxes, they're being used by supermarkets. Uh, they have a lifespan. So there's lots of them about secondhand and they're quite cheap. Um, you can pick up uh, these used refrigerated truck boxes from between 600 to a thousand pounds um my hope was that they'd be able to drive it here on the truck um because we it were quite inaccessible there's a there's a steep hill uh, with a double bend um but unfortunately i couldn't find anyone who was just going to drive it uh from a truck i'd only get them from breakers yards and it was going to come here on a high app but yeah it, it couldn't it, it was getting too complicated but um uh i found this um uh trailer um, it's a similar dimensions, a box trailer that was made um, uh, specifically. It was, it was made to um, uh, transport old Formula One racing cars, so, but that's uh, beside the point. But anyway, yeah, so it's the it's same dimensions as, a, as one of these small uh, truck boxes. Uh, but now we have this mobile grow room. Um, so um, this is roughly what we've done. It's, uh, there's, there's fans on the underside of the, um, of the trailer. Yep. Um, uh, so inlet, and outlet. Um, these are on a timer. There's a humidifier that comes on. Um, and uh, uh, the, we have this, um, uh, yeah, we're going to experiment with using a, a, a comp, uh, compost heating system to, uh, to, to maintain the temperature over the over the winter um but anyway that's what it looks like at the moment um we've got these uh so the shelving um i've used these bars with uh pvc piping um so we can adjust them uh it worked out yeah shelving is really expensive and this worked out a cheaper way of doing it and i can also use the bars to hang the substrates from um but you can see there we've got the um uh the ducting um pumped in the humidifier there um at the bottom. So uh, all in all, it, uh, this would cost um, the to, to fit out. Well, the problem is we had to we had to, we had to insulate this and uh, and and uh, clad it. But um, with these refrigerated truck boxes, they already come insulated and cladded. So 
you could set up a grow room with one of these truck boxes for less than two thousand um, uh, pounds. The uh, the fans, the most expensive piece of equipment was the humidifier, but everything else is relatively cheap. Um, yeah, so uh, um, there's this other issue about the, um, uh, the supply of the spawn. So what I'd like to be able to do is, is, is supply uh, 10 growers within sort of a kind of 30, 40 mile radius of where I am here. So mostly sort of in Carmarthenshire, South Wales. Um, I, I'm set up to do that. Um, I, I, uh, uh, it wouldn't be too much of an effort to, um, uh, to set someone else up doing this. Um, but yeah, um, I'm lucky that uh, a lot of this equipment was already here um, when I got here. Um, I took on an existing uh, growing scheme. Um, but uh, yeah, this is the kind of equipment involved. Um, and this is a rough sketch of, of what would be required to supply 10 growers who are adopting those schemes I suggested. Um, uh, yeah, so um, if, if I'm, you know, if I'm producing this amount of spawn and selling it for five pound a kilo, um, uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, how much I could make uh, gross income. Um, so Tom, you probably here want to pick that apart a bit, um, but uh, yeah, this is a. Uh, um, this is relatively uh, simple for me to do, just expanding what I'm already doing. So the, um, the issue is with uh, growing uh, mushrooms, if you want to take control of the whole process. Um, it is a lot of investment. You know, if you want to grow your own, make your own inoc inoculants, um, you want to make your own spawn, uh, investing in the lab here is, is a big expense and it requires a lot of uh, skills and techniques that are a bit more specialized. It takes time to learn them. So uh, my hope is that if we can make more small to medium scale growers, um, they can group together. Uh, and then one of them uh, who might have some you know, uh, skills that are applicable to setting up a lab might be able to take on that responsibility and supply uh those growers in that region um so yeah this will be fleshed out a bit more um uh but this yeah this is as you see this were the annual requirements um for uh for 10 growers taking up one of those schemes um yeah so uh we have um uh so all this will be presented in the website this is um the website here um uh, and so it has an overview of these four stages of cultivation um, and uh, um, uh, there'll be a, a full description of what's required to make one of these spawn, spawn labs. Um, the truck box design with the control units uh, will all be on there. And then growing schemes, uh, an overview of what it requ what, what's required to grow 10 kilos of each one of these uh, uh, species of mushrooms, um, which you can then see whether that's something you could scale. Um, uh, yeah, um, so that's it. Sorry, for a bit, it was a bit rambling, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can go. It's it's quite a lot to cover. You, um, I, but um, hopefully, that gives you an overview of what we're trying to do. Thank you so much, James. Uh, there, there's, I think, there might be uh, questions or. Uh, things that Tom might want to say or other people, um, but just um, time-wise, Carolyn, if we could um, have you up next. Thanks so much, James. You're muted at the moment, Carolyn. We can see your notes now, Carolyn. Yeah, I know, and that's not what I, I need to see those. 
Just coming a little bit. So I think there's a couple of people that might have joined after the intro. So Carolyn's um, going to be talking a little bit more about Pete, just a, a few slides on Pete, as that's a, a somewhat contentious issue in um, mushroom growing, the, the button mushroom. Um, which is a different thing altogether. Yeah, that's that's good, Karen. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, I'm just I'm working off two screens, which my mouse is uh, having problems with. But um, okay, so if you can see that, yeah. So as um, Hugh's... you're a bit quiet, Karen. Is your mic? Is that better? Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so as you said, I'm a horticultural advisor for the Soil Association and um, one of the topics I've been covering um, generally since I joined was um, the use of peat within the horticultural sector. So um, I was just going to take you through um, a very whistle-stop tour with the um, touching on mushroom produ production, but um, just on what the current status is regarding peat in the UK, um, projects that have been undertaken regarding um, looking at peat alternatives and the stumbling blocks that we see um, within um, peat, particularly within mushroom production. So um, the current status, where are we at the moment? Um, so DEFRA launched the peat action plan back in May of this year. Um, it covers all, all aspects of peat management and restoration. Um, and uh, so they're looking at consulting on the ban of peat um, and peat containing products for the amateur market by the end of um, 2021. So that'll be um, based in part to see any feedback from that um, to date. So they're going to also be looking at the um, full consultation of phasing out peat within the um, commercial horticultural sector. Um, so I think, sorry, I think that should be by the end of 2025. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that two thirds of the peat sold in the UK is imported. So there's an, there's an issue there around exporting, um, exporting the issue out of the UK um, to places like Holland and Ireland where we're importing it from. And 80% of the peat products that are used are used within the amateur sector. So um, we're doing a lot of work with the likes of Blue Diamond, the garden centre chain, looking at reducing peat um, and using alternatives within uh, the amateur sector. Um, the alternatives and the issues around those, the when we're looking at peat alternatives such as wood chip, coir, um, and things and green waste compost is the resilience of those supply chains. How, can we get enough product? Um, what's the availability of those? And the environmental implications around those, some of those alternatives as well um, are a concern. And it's something that you know, we need to work hard and making sure um, that we're you know, fully, fully, um, fully versed on what they are. Um, the organic um, requirement for peat is so within the soil association standard, where only where we only allow peat within the pro as a propagation medium, and we're looking to phase that out by 2025. So to support this aim, we continue work with growers and licensees to develop further research to to assist them in making that change. So work done to date, of the in this area are, um, so there's projects undertaken so far. So Soil Association are um, partners with innovative farmers. And we um, look at using field-based, farmer-based research. Um, and uh, one of the projects that have been undertaken so far is um, investigating the use of peat-free alternatives in propagation of plants such as leek and cabbage. So they've looked at a trial of wood chip compost um, and that was, it was the wood chip compost that proved most beneficial when you compared that to biochar commercially certified green waste compost um, and a, a wood chip compost in, enriched with biochar. So that's, um, 
so that was it was a good result so we can see that there are alternatives available and um, it's just our ability to scale those up to more commercial production which i can um, which i'll touch on later there's also an ahd brief project which was undertaken between 2010 and 2013 which looked at developing different irrigation strategies with reduced peat and peat free um, alternative growing mediums and this was it within the hardy nursery stock sector and the main um, findings within that project particularly was all around um, the watering requirements so they looked at the outcomes of that were predominantly we needed to irrigate more um, the growing medium more regularly but at less but at a lesser volume so it would increase the labor input required and that's all to do that's all to do with the um, water holding capacity of peat free alternatives and then uh, just to follow on from that there was a um, an additional study around um, which was done by the AHDB as well around the responsibility of sourcing of alternative growing mediums um, And then uh, we're continually working with producers as well to look at the reduction in the module and, and block size um, to reducing the overall peat requirement. So the stumbling blocks that we see um, currently focusing on um, peat use in um, or reducing peat use in uh, mushroom production is the transfer of fungal pathogens um, from the uh, peat free alternatives um, and their ability to and the ability for the pathogens to sporulate and reproduce in the con in favorable conditions within a mushroom growing operation so it's uh, more work needs to be done on the sterilizing of peat free alternatives the moisture holding capacity of peat free alternatives as well and the altering of the feeding and watering regimes required and uh, as I touched on before, it's the maintaining the production of these peat free alternatives. And as Tom said, the importance of getting a consistent growing medium to result that which results in a consistent uh, product when we're looking at commercial um, commercial production and funding as well. So with the changes within the AHDB um, horticultural division pending, um, we're looking at we're looking at harnessing further, um, further additional funding and linking together um, growers, academics and facilitators. So we work quite hard on that. Um, and, the, and the availability of peat free alternatives is challenging as well, particularly in the last 12 to 18 months. So the availability of COIA and just, um, and just generally uh, is, the, is the supply chain fit to fit to cope with the increase in demand so we do quite a lot of work within this within the whole supply chain as well ensuring that when we do go for it when, when we are looking to change the standard significantly like like phasing out peak completely is the supply chain fit for purpose to supply the increase in demand and then um, again there's an issue on price so how can we support growers when we know there's going to be an increase in their um in their cost of production, whether that be an increase in labour cost, as, as I say, for the uh, watering or um, um, watering and irrigation and feeding programmes when we're looking at peat free alternatives, whether it's to do with lack of continuity or increased labour cost. Um, how can we support growers in ensuring that they're getting a um, an increase in price at their point of sale or the, the price is disseminated through through the whole supply chain? And that is it. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, now, I just noticed actually, uh, is Tom there? No, he's not there. I uh, noticed you had an un unanswered question um, to, to Tom. But uh, yeah, James, did you have a view on peat in, in mushroom production? Um, is generally used as casing in, in button mushrooms. Um, you know what, what sort of steps can we take to reducing or finding alternative medium what, what, what are the solutions here um it, well uh i don't grow those kind of mushrooms and because we couldn't compete with the with the the industrial scale 
that uh, those mushrooms are produced on. Um, so, uh, um, yes, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. It's not something. Yeah, I, I have, I, I do have some peat um, because I do uh, demonstrate how to make casing layers. Um, uh, one uh, alternative is is using leaf mulch. So I do make so for making seed compost. I, I, I use an IBC with a with a uh, with a uh, galvanized wire to make um uh you know what's it could be used as you know as a casing layer with it so casing layer for with reishi trench cultures um uh, a, a light casing with vermiculite is used but um uh, i can you i can get away with using more carbon rich you know, municipal compost so yeah it's just with with the agaricus i mean it's just you know a huge amount of investment has gone into researching uh, you know the exact kind of microbial slurries they need to use on these casing layers and, and so on um yeah it's just um um it's just not something that on a some you know can you know we can compete with on a small to medium scale that's why i mentioned the almond portobello you didn't need to have a casing layer to grow that on leech cow manure it's a niche mushroom it has medicinal value um uh, you know, it, it 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 tastes and looks very similar to the portobello. In fact, it tastes better, in my opinion. Um, so my my opinion is just yeah, we should just be growing other mushrooms. Um, it, yeah, it's in in the UK we're not very um, adventurous when it comes to different kinds of fungi. Um, so most people are just aware of the white and brown mushrooms you can get in the supermarket. It's all the same species: the white, brown, cremini, portobello. It's all the same species, um, yeah. So uh, it's not that it's just not that interesting, in my opinion, when you've got all these other species of these uh, other flavors, other textures, um, and they have. You know, shiitake is, is one of the most medicinally valuable mushrooms um, uh, you can get. Um, it, it has a you know huge range of antiviral um, uh, compounds and and uh, there's a lot of research into sort of anti tumor development, this kind of thing. High vitamin D content, as I mentioned. So, you know, there's, uh, yeah, I, I think um, we should we should be a bit more adventurous and explore these um, these other species. And the, the more people do that, the more demand there is, and then the more opportunities there are then for small to medium scale growers to to have a sideline in those in those mushrooms because it'd be easy for them to to sell no thanks for that james this is i think is a really interesting point um as we look at trying to reduce peat and often focusing just solely on that the the that particular species of mushroom and that way of producing and we feel yeah probably locked into that somewhat in the supermarket uh, models and and this diversification um, message that that you've had throughout sort of throughout your um, presentation is 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 a, is an, a really inter interesting and valuable one. Um, now I'm I'm seeing that we we've hit the eight thirty mark. Um, I'm also seeing I don't know if this, there's some kind of emergency over there. There's scurrying about um, for, from in in the Tom Baxter sector. So I'm not sure if we're going to get a final comment from Tom, um, but it, it, well, at least we get to see some nice looking mushrooms in the background there. Um, Anna, we need to round up now, right? If if uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to stay on, you can as well. But if you want to wrap up, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, were there any other outstanding questions then just briefly? I see, actually, there's a new message just coming. Okay, thanks, Connor. Yeah, there's been some, I think there's been some questions and comments answered in the in the thread already. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to hear back from Tom on, you know, where, how, when do you anticipate being able to break even? What What is it? What is it, the, the final push to get that? What was it, 27K a month? Um, and, and yes, it's interesting, these different scales that are at play. James, I think you said you're working towards something like 10K a year. Uh, 
profit was that was that right um and so yeah there's this different scales at play here so that obviously that's that's uh, what we were aiming for to 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 present different um insights into into this and um uh, i think it's been really interesting and i hope i hope we get to reach more people with the recording as well because there's been some really interesting insights into into potential pitfalls the gritty reality of scaling up to something like you know a big running a big business that's just simply focusing on mushroom production production um and and other tinctures and things like that and then opportunities um for incorporating things um you know more outdoors or different varieties um and scaling up using um logs and 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 uh, and i dare say uh you know teaming up with agroforestry systems as well as you know opportunities for wood chips i've been looking into can we optimize how do we optimize mulches such as wood chip around certain trees can you get a crop can you get a yield of, of mushrooms outdoors that sort of thing i think they're quite interesting angles as 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 we sort of push for um, increase of agro forestry systems um so i think there are some good there are some hopefully some good uh, synergies there all right i think i think we're there um i'll <laughs> i'll be in touch with tom to check he's check he's all right um but uh, I, I, hope, I hope you found that really useful. Um, everybody that was here, I certainly did. So I think we'll we'll say uh, good evening, and uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.